Hey guys, this is Caleb with the Command Valley, bringing you another Commander Deck Tech. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video. If you want to check out their new and improved store and support the channel while doing so, check out the link in the description below. We have a deck list in the description that you can copy and paste right into the deck builder and buy your singles there. If you want to support the channel directly, head over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to sign up today. With that out of the way, let's dive into today's commander, Akiri Fearless Voyager. Akiri costs one generic, a red, and a white to cast. She is a 3-3 core warrior, and she has two abilities. The first says, whenever you attack a player with one or more equipped creatures, draw a card. Note that this draws you one card per player that you attack with at least one equipped creature, not for each equipped creature that you attack with. Her second ability costs one white to activate and says you may unattach an equipment from a creature you control. If you do, tap that creature and it gains indestructible until end of turn. So obviously we're going to be building an equipment themed deck to capitalize on these two great abilities, especially the one that lets us draw cards. Commander players usually get really excited when a commander says do X and then draw a card, or has built-in protection, and Akiri has and does both. Not to mention, Akiri is already a well-known character from the story with a previous card that a lot of players really like, so I'm guessing that she's going to be a pretty popular commander from this new set. But what are the ways that you can build an Akiri deck? I usually like building commanders that have multiple different avenues or way to build around them, and Akiri is no exception to that. You can build a combo deck around Sunforger or a different combo deck around Underworld Breach. You can play all the best equipments like the Swords of X and Y and cards that synergize with equipments like Leonin Shikari and Stoneforge Mystic. Or you can play low to the ground equipments and creatures like Shuko and Fervent Champion, then play tons of board wipes and protect your stuff with Akiri. You can focus on combat or even getting multiple combats to draw tons of cards until you hit the big finishers in your deck. And I'm sure there are many other strategies. Usually I like to take the best of the most fun parts of a couple of the strategies and mash them together when I build a deck, so I will mostly be focusing on playing low to the ground creatures and equipments in the early game with big finishers like Elish Norn and multiple combat cards like Savage Beating. Most of the early game creatures you are going to be looking to play are going to be your white flyers like Sarah Ascendant, Healer's Hawk, and Archon of Ameria, etc. Really the idea is to get cheap creatures with evasion or double strike that, when equipped, can easily trigger a Kiri's ability to draw you cards without having to use her protection ability. Other good evasive or double striking creatures can include Etched Champion, Swift Blade Vindicator, Core Blade Master from the new set, and Mirren Crusader. Creatures that you want to play in the mid game are going to be your enablers that we will talk about in other categories, but can also include cards such as Leon and Shikari, which allows you to activate equip abilities at instant speed, which is super helpful, especially with the cards that cost zero to equip or cards that reduce your equipping costs. Creatures to play towards the end of the game include Elish Norn, Gisela Blade of Gold Knight, and Adriana, Captain of the Guard, which all get even better with the creatures and non-creature spells that are going to give us multiple combat steps, which is how we're going to aim to win the game. Adriana giving all of your creatures melee for just two combat steps can make all of your creatures get up to plus six plus six by the second combat step, which is absolutely nuts. And I won't be surprised when you can get two, three, or even four, and maybe even infinite combat steps in this deck. We have some other ways of making our creatures evasive or even unblockable in the form of equipments. Basilisk Collar and Infiltration Lens don't exactly give your equipped creatures unblockable, but it does make players less likely to block when your creature has Death Touch or you get to draw an additional two cards if it's blocked. If they do block, you can always make your creature indestructible with a Kiri, which is especially great with Infiltration Lens because you'll still get the trigger to draw two cards if you time it right, plus the trigger to draw a card from attacking. 
we are going to want a ton of ramp in this deck and Boros is not known for having the best ramp. So we are mostly going to be playing cheap mana rocks that we can get out early so we can be playing creatures and getting them equipped as soon as possible. A lot of players love equipment decks and I have built quite a few of them over the years and one of the biggest problems that I always have is having to pay equip costs over and over and over again which can get really expensive and really annoying. So that is why we're going to run as much cheap ramp as possible. Explorer's Scope fits into the deck quite nicely and is a cheap equipment that can get us extra lands from the top of our deck. Wayfarer's Bobble is a great card and fits in almost every deck that is not playing green. Possible two drops include Arcane Signet, Boro Signet, Cold Steel Heart, Fire Diamond, Knight of the White Orchid, Marble Diamond, Mind Stone, Star Compass, Talisman of Conviction, and Thought Vessel. Dowsing Dagger and Sword of the Animist also cost only two to play, then require a little more work. But flipping Dowsing Dagger to a land that taps for three mana in the early game feels so nice and will not be super difficult to do in our deck. More expensive ramp cards can include Burnished Heart, Neheb Dreadhorde Champion, Neheb the Eternal, Smothering Tithe, Solemn Simulacrum, and Sword of Feast and Famine, which is one of the absolute best cards that you can actually have in this deck, and unfortunately, its price tag reflects that. We'll talk more about this sword and the other swords of X and Y in a bit, but I would run at least 12 of these cards and no more than 14. Having colored mana early is super vital to getting our commander out, so even though they're obviously amazing cards, I'd honestly rather have an Arcane Signet in my starting hand than a Mana Crypt or a Mana Vault, which sounds kind of weird, but you really want to get a Kiri out as soon as possible. On top of our ramp, we've got a bunch of cards that we can play that will lower the cost to play equipments, to equip creatures, or possibly even make it entirely free. Ariok Steel Shaper, Danitha Capuchin, and Zerda the Dawn Waker all reduce the cost of playing equipments or equipping them. Shuko and Lightning Greaves cost zero to equip, and Sigarda's Aid and Hammer of Nazan both make it so your equipments enter attached to a creature that you control. Ballin, Brass Squire, and Kazul's Toll Collector have activated abilities that allow you to equip for free or cheap at instant speed. Moving on, let's talk about what some of our options are for drawing more cards. Again, Boros is not known for being particularly good at drawing cards either. Despite our commander having it stapled right on her, I would still run at least 8 other cards that will draw you more cards. Lantax sort of falls into this category by letting you search for 3 basics on each of your upkeeps if you have less lands than someone at the table, which you will. Mangara the Diplomat is a great step in the right direction for getting decent card draw in white. Pure Steel Paladin and Sram Senior Edificer both draw you cards when you play equipments. And Stone Haven Outfitter buffs your equipped creatures and draws you a card when they die. It seems kind of bad since we are trying to protect our equipped creatures from dying with a carry, but you will still have equipped creatures die while playing this deck. Mask of Memory and Rogue's Gloves draw you cards when the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player. Skull Clamp is amazingly efficient, but does require the equipped creature to die in order to draw two cards. Valakut Awakening from the new set is kind of card draw, but it's more of card selection. The amazing thing about this card is that it is also a land on the other side, which is incredibly powerful. I'm really excited for all of these new modal dual-faced cards. If you've got Wheel of Fortune, then definitely play it in this deck. If not, no worries. There are a couple of other ways that we can draw a few cards that we'll talk about in other sections. And don't forget, we should be drawing a decent amount of cards from our commander anyway. Next up is Tutors, and there are quite a few of them that we can use to find exactly which equipments we need when we need them most. For creatures, we can play Goblin Engineer, Goto Bandit Warlord, Relic Seeker, Stoneforge Mystic, which was recently reprinted in Double Masters, so grab some while they're cheap, and Stonehewer Giant. You can also play Enlightened Tutor, Inventor's Fair, Open the Armory, and Steel Shaper's Gift. The equipments you are most often going to want to search for are probably the swords, which can be used for either defense or offense, 
Shadow Spear, which can help you remove hexproof and indestructible creatures, and possibly the best equipment in the deck, Sunforger. Sunforger costs 3 generic mana to cast. It costs 3 to equip and gives the equipped creature plus 4 plus 0. Then you can pay a red and a white to unattach Sunforger and search your deck for a red or white instant with CMC 4 or less. Then you cast it without paying its mana cost. This works great with removal spells and protection spells. For removal, you can run Chaos Warp, Dispatch, Path to Exile, Swords to Plowshares, and Wear and Tear, which can all be cast using Sunforger. You can even run Mana Tithe and Lapse of Certainty to counter something if the moment calls for it, which no one will be expecting from your Boros deck. Neither of these are amazing counter spells, but they are great targets for Sunforger. As for board wipes, it's probably best to keep them as cheap to cast as possible so that you have leftover mana to save your equipped creatures. Wrath of God and Day of Judgment are as cheap as they come in white. Blasphemous Act is usually super cheap to cast with multiple players at the table, and will usually leave you a lot of leftover mana that you can use to make sure your creatures are indestructible with Akiri. Winds of Abandon and Austere Command are also both great ways to get one-sided board wipes. Vandal Blast is another awesome one-sided card that can destroy all of your opponent's artifacts for just 5 mana. Going back to Sunforger, we can also use it for casting protection spells such as Deflecting Swat, Flawless Maneuver, and Teferi's Protection. Akiri already does a good job at making sure that we can swing with our equipped creatures, get a draw trigger or two, and unattach equipments for protection when we need it. However, there are other ways to protect our hard-earned investments into playing and equipping equipments. Dolmen Gate, Erois, God of Victory, and Loyal Unicorn prevent all damage that will be dealt to attacking creatures that you control. And being able to swing in worry-free to draw some cards feels so good. Other ways we can protect our creatures include Dark Steel Plate, which is indestructible and gives the equipped creature indestructible, Selfless Spirit, Giver of Runes, Mother of Runes, Lightning Greaves, and Swiftfoot Boots. Finally, we have all the Swords of X and Y. These not only protect your creatures from being targeted by spells of certain colors, it also makes them unblockable against creatures of those colors as well, which is awesome for this strategy. Some are really expensive and you don't have to play them all, but I would start with the ones that give equipped creatures protection from white or red to survive your own board wipes. Sword of Feast and Famine is one of the most expensive but also a key piece to our strategy. Like all these swords, it gives the equipped creature plus two plus two and protection from two colors, in this case black and green. It also says, whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card and you untap all lands you control. This can give you access to insane amount of mana and even combos with other cards that we're going to talk about in a minute that will give you infinite combat steps, which is one of the best ways to win in this deck. As I said before, the strategy of the Akiri deck that I want to build is play low to the ground creatures and equipments, attack one or two players repeatedly to draw lots of cards, and eventually draw into our big finishers after we've enhanced and protected our board. Some of those big finishers are going to be cards that give us multiple combat steps. There are a surprising amount of them that we can choose from and play such as Aurelia the War Leader, Combat Celebrant, and Morog Fury of Aquam for creatures. There are even more non-creature options such as Fury of the Horde, The Resurgence Half of Response Resurgence, Savage Beating, Seize the Day, and World at War. The two that have potential to give you infinite combat steps with Sword of Feast and Famine are Aggravated Assault and Waves of Aggression. Usually, just getting a creature like Aurelia will be good enough to win the game. However, this combo is a surefire way of ending the game as long as you have carefully crafted and protected your board state and can protect the combo. It might seem like a two card combo that can result in some feel bads, but it's actually a lot of work to make sure that you can win with it. Lastly, my land base currently looks something like this, but may change slightly by the time you check out the deck list because I'm still working on the deck. I am running Battlefield Forge. Clifftop Retreat, Needle Verge Pathway, Rugged Prairie, Sacred Foundry, Sunbaked Canyon, and Temple of Triumph as my dual lands. Buried Ruin, Evolving Wilds, Inventor's Fair, Myriad Landscape, Reliquary Tower, Rogue's Passage, Scavenger Grounds, and Slayer's Stronghold as utility lands. 
Command Tower and Fabled Passage as my Rainbow Lands, Valakut Awakening or Valakut Stoneforge as a modal double-faced card, and 13 Plains and 6 Mountains. All right, you've made it to the end of the video and I have left a ton of decisions up to you, so have fun brewing. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet. Be sure to check out and sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to support us directly, view exclusive content, join in on our Discord, and receive merch and tons of other sweet perks. Thanks again to Game Grid Lehigh for sponsoring this channel. You can click on the link to their website in the description to shop for all of your magic needs and you'll be supporting the channel at the same time. Game Grid is now shipping nationwide, so take advantage of that. Be sure to join us for our live streams every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time for some brawl on Arena. Lastly, you can find us on Twitter at CommandValleyP1 and on Facebook by clicking the link below. Thanks everyone, stay safe out there.